Hello everyone, this is Alan, and in today's video we're going to be doing a Calculus 2 in a nutshell video, so let's get right into it. So the main topics in Calculus 2 is that there is an area underneath the curve, integration techniques, series and sequences, conics like circle, hyperbola, and ellipses, and then parametric and polar and Cartesian systems. So let's get right into it. So in this section, we're going to be talking about the area underneath the curve. So what happens if two graphs intersect one another, and how do we determine the area underneath the curve? So we will be talking about different revolutions around the axes by using the disk, washer, or shell methods in different scenarios. So an idea of the area underneath the two curves is where you can have two equations, where as you can see in this example, you have f of x and you have g of x. So in this iteration, you would have the top of the equation minus the bottom of the equation, and then you would set up an integral from left to right. And then the same thing would happen if you had equations that would overlap one another. So if that were the case, you would go from left to right. And at the bottom here, you can see there is a Riemann sum of f of x minus g of x with delta x or delta y, depending on the orientation with the axis. So the very first method that we're going to be talking about is the disk method. So as you can see here, here is our lovely disk, and then this is our rectangle of the area. And so what we have to need to know is we need to know the radius underneath the curve, and then we also need a height, and depending on the axis, it could be delta x or delta y. And then the equation for the disk method is pi r squared. So the r represents the radius, and it's squared. And then you would set up an integral from left to right, and it would be d of x or d of y, depending on whether uh, the areas that you're talking about is left to right or up to down. And then your Riemann sum that you would have to make is this iteration right here. So it would be pi r squared. And then you would set up your Riemann sum with the limit as well. And as I said, depending on the axis, left to right, could be delta x or delta y. So the next method that we're going to be talking about is the washer method. And the reason why it is called the washer method is that if you have two curves like this, you're going to have two areas that are going to be separating, and they will form a washer if you revolve it around a particular axis. And so for this, you ha would have to know the outer radius and the inner radius especially the height, which is either delta x or delta y, depending on the orientation. The equation that would be used for the wash method would be pi r squared, and that r would be the outer radius squared minus the inner radius squared, and depending on the orientation would be dx or dy, and then your Riemann sum would be set up in this limit right here. So the last method that we will be talking about is the shell method, and as you can see, you have y equals f of x, and this is the area that would have to revolve around the y-axis. And as you can see, there is a cylinder in the center that would be necessarily empty. And then you would have to know the height, the radius, and the thickness of um, the shape that you're trying to transform here, which is either going to be delta x or delta y. And the equation will be relatively different than what you have used for the disk and washer method. So you will be then dealing with 2 pi times the radius times the height and your thickness, which is dx or dy, and you would set it up in this integral. And the Riemann sum is pretty much the same thing, but you would have to set up this limit right here. So the next big topic that you would have to talk about in Calculus 2 are the different kind of integration techniques. So if you deal with more difficult integrals, how would you be able to solve them? So that is what we will be talking about in this section. So there are different kinds of integration techniques that are used in Calculus 2. And uh, major ones are integration by parts, trigonometric integrals, which is in relation to trigonometric substitution, and then you also have partial fraction decomposition. So now we're going to be taking a look at the integration by parts. So you can see we have a sample of what we're talking about. So you have the integral of u equals dv equals u times v minus the integral of v du. So you may think, well, what does this all mean? And how is this all going to work out in these particular problems? Well, let's try it out. 
the main things that you will have to know is what are your you and then what are going to be your other parts of the entire equation itself so you're gonna have u and then you're gonna have dv right so the things that you want to make sure that you don't want to repeat will not go for the u so whenever you're doing your dv always take a look at e to the x so with that being said your dv will be the integral of e to the x dx and then your u will just simply be x because with this you're then going to take the derivative of both of these so then your du will then be formed so your du will then be your dv excuse me will be dx and then your dv will then turn into a v and that's just going to be simply e to the x because if you do the derivative of the integral you're going to basically cancel it out and the integral of e to the x is just e to the x so if we follow this procedure with u times v minus the integral of v du you're going to get x times e to the x minus the integral of e to the x dx and this simply just becomes e to the x so if you want to simplify this out further you're then going to have the final result of e to the x times x minus 1 plus c so that right there is on how you would solve that particular example and then we will move on into on our right and you see we got x here and we also got a trig identity here which is just sine of x so our u is going to be simply x and then our dv is going to be the integral of sine of x dx and then if we do du you're just going to get dx and then your v if you do the integral of sine you're going to get negative cosine of x dx and so when we put this all together you're going to get u which is going to be x times negative cosine of x okay minus the integral of negative cosine of x dx and so when you solve this on through um, you know you can take out the negatives here and you can uh, plug it in into the x here but we will simply do that after all of this so if you want to do that uh, you would then get negative sign but then if you pull that all out uh, you're going to get negative x uh, times cosine of x and then you would just have plus sine of x plus c so that right there will be the answer to that question so that is integration by parts so on this slide this is where you have all the trigonometric substitution identities so this is where you would have all the common functions and this is where you would have to know these by heart and then you may be given difficult situations where you have the integral of secant of theta d theta and then you have cosecant of, of theta d theta and then you have power reducing identities and then you may be given a double angle identity so these are some of the things that you would have to know but as you go through your Calculus 2 course, you'll start to do more practice with them and you'll start to understand them a lot more. So now we will move into trigonometric substitution. So this is a little bit more trickier now. So based on the trig identities that we have seen in the previous slide, we can be able to solve these particular problems. So secant of 4x dx. Uh, you would be able to try and solve this by trying to split up secant of 4x. So the way that you would want to do this is you would write out the integral secant of 2x times 
secant of 2x dx. And with secant of 2x, you can actually break it up um, further. So this segment can then be 1 plus tangent squared of x. And with that being said, you can then do u substitution. So your u substitution would just be u equals tan of x. And then that would transform. If you do the derivative of it, you're just going to get secant squared of x. And so with that being said, um, how that would all work, um, then you would rewrite this entire equation. So you would just have 1 plus u squared du with u substitution. And then you would be able to solve the integral by doing that. So when you do that, you do u plus u in power of 3 over 3. And then you just replace the u, and then you're pretty much done with that. So let me just write it down here. So u would just be tangent of x plus tan of 3 of x over 3 plus c. And that is your answer for that question. And then for this example, for a tangent of x, you could do trigonometric substitution, or I would like to break up the equation even further, where you could have sine of x in the top and cosine of x in the bottom, and then you would have dx. And so with that, you can then do u substitution, where your u is going to be cosine of x. And then if you do du, you're going to get negative sine of x uh, dx so that is going to replace the top so what then that's going to do is you're going to then have negative 1 over u du and with this particular segment uh, 1 over u if you do the integral of that you're then going to have negative ln uh, bracket of u and close bracket plus c and then your u is your cosine of x. So negative ln bracket of cosine of x, close the bracket, plus c. And that is your answer for that. So that is the basic fundamentals of trigonometric substitution. So now we will move on into partial fraction decomposition. So in this example, we already have some sort of decomposition in relation to a over x plus 6 plus b over x minus 6 equals 36. So you're able to break that up into uh, different parts. So x minus 2 minus 36 can be broken up into x minus 6 and x plus 6. And then that's where that a plus b iteration comes into play and that would equal to the numerator. So with that being said, then we would be able to uh, do some cross multiplication for uh, partial fraction decomposition. So with that being said, you would then have a times x minus 6 plus b x plus 6 equal to 36. And so now you're able to try and find a and b. So in order to do that, you would have to change up the function quite a bit and we would have to set one of these x's to zero. So we're gonna set up uh, six um, for this first one. So x is gonna be six. So with that being said, six minus six equals zero, so that cancels out the a. But then your b times uh, six plus six, which is 12, equals 36. And then if you do 36 divided by uh, 12, your b, it's going to be 3. And so you do the same thing with A, where your B, right here, you're going to have an X, and this X is going to be negative 6. And so you're going to uh, try and do this all throughout. And so then your A is going to be vice versa, and it's going to be negative 3. And so if we put this all together, um, where you would have A being negative 3, so you would have negative 3 in the numerator over x plus 6 
plus your b which is discovered as 3 over x minus 6 and now the 36 really can just be uh, alleviated because we decomposed this initial integral to then be transformed into this integral. So now we can be able to solve these integrals and with all of this being said pull out the negatives, pull out the top coefficients and you just be left with lns. So then with this being said you would just then have negative 3 ln of x plus 6 correct and then you would have plus 3 ln of x minus 6 and then you would have plus c so that would be the answer for that partial fraction decomposition so now we move on into one of the most favorited um, and one of the hardest uh, parts of Calculus 2, which are series and sequences. Um, initially, you start learning sequences, which can be relatively easy, but then there are many different kinds of series that you will have to deal with, especially the different kind of tests and rules that you would have to apply with them. So let's get into it. So now we'll move on into geometric sequences and series. So on the very left here, we have a general form of what you would see in a sequence. So this would be a partial sequence they would have to deal with, and this is a sequence they would have to deal with overall. A1 is the very first term that you would start off with, and your n is the amount of terms that are in that particular sequence. And r is going to be the rate that the sequence is uh, moving up or down or basically a rate of change. And then on our right here we have a general series and we would have a rate alongside it as well and a starting term. And it's all written in sigma notation. And if your rate of change is less than one it converges, but if it is greater than one it diverges. So let's take a look in this particular example for this uh, sequence. So uh, whenever you're dealing with a sequence, you have to light, write that in uh, limit notation. So as limit as n approaches infinity, n to power 3 plus 2n plus 4 all over 4n to power 3 plus 4n plus 1. And so if you were to be able to solve this, you can use El Hapitals. And El Hapitals basically states that the form of the limit, uh, you could use the derivative, and you would have to have it 0 or 0 form, or in form of infinity over infinity. So that's when you're able to take the derivative. And you could do this up to three times, but based on having the same amount of power, and that is the trick that I like to use, since you have n in power 3 and n in power 3 are the highest powers in this particular limit, the answer to this sequence is going to be a fourth. So that's the answer to that. So whenever you're dealing with series, you're going to have eight different kinds of rules. Now, as you can see, it is pretty intimidating with all these different kinds of rules. But trust me, as you start dealing with more particular problems and you start uh, having a good repetition on these kind of problems, you're going to get really used to them and it's going to be a piece of cake. So here are all the uh, different rules that comply when you're dealing with different series. So let's just try them out. So in the very first example of uh, the series that we will have to deal with, we have to identify what kind of uh, rule or test that we would have to use. And since we have a factorial, the only way that we would be able to use this test or be able to solve this series is by using the ratio test. I'll just write it up here just in case. And so what the ratio test identifies is that r equals to the limit as k approaches infinity and then you have ak plus 1 over ak 
and your AK plus one, what that means is you have K on over here, this one, this particular one, and that one as well. That will be in the numerator and then in the denominator you will also have the absolute value of this as well. And so when we write this all out, um, what happens is that you have this alternating series here as well with the negative one and k plus one. What happens is, is that this um, pretty much gets eliminated um, and you do more ratio tests and it really doesn't comply uh, with the ratio test but with the alternating series or with any other series that you deal with that's the most important so it really doesn't uh, comply to this so what you're dealing with here realistically is you're dealing with uh, 10 and k plus 1 and that's in the numerator and then in the denominator you will have k factorial plus 1 but this is also inside of that factorial because it's the k that we're dealing with here so you're adding that one to that k and so then we do likewise with this particular limit we just have a regular limit but we do the reciprocal since it's in the denominator we have k factorial over 10 to the power of k and so you can rewrite this as a full on limit, but 10 and k plus 1 is the same as 10 in power of k times 10. Okay. And so with that, uh, k in factorial plus 1 times the factorial is going to be uh, k plus 1 times k factorial. And that is the rule on factorials. Whenever you're trying to deal with higher order factorials, you break it up into uh, 3, 2, 1, and then the actual factorial itself. And so with that being said, you have 10k here, and you have 10k here, and you can cancel out the factorials. And so what you're really left with is just the limit that you're evaluating of limit of k as k approaches infinity of 10 over k plus 1. So that really then simplifies it uh, a whole lot and makes it a lot easier. And so with that being said, if infinity as k approaches infinity, uh, your infinity is going to get, um, or more so your denominator is going to get very, very large and that's going to eventually approach 0. And so with that being said, uh, based on the ratio test, um, your R is less than 1, thus it is convergent. So that's on how you would have to solve that particular problem. And then in this series that is on our right, uh, what we would have to use is a geometric series. And so the way that we would want to uh, break this all up is we can break this up by really telling ourselves, well, what kind of test can we use? And you can actually use it as a um, the geometric series and the p-series in this as well. So the way that I'm doing this is you can see that um, the in power of k's are alike. So your r, your rate, is going to be 5 eighths of k times 1 over k squared. That should be squared out of k. And with that being said, um, this uh, particular series converges based on the p-series where the p-value or your r-value is less than 1, thus it is convergent by p 
series. So that's on how you would have to do some examples of series like this. So now we move on into uh, conduct sections in Calculus 2, which is uh, tends to be the easiest section of Calculus 2. So I'm, all I'm really going to show you are the different kind of sections that you will have to deal with, and um, there will be more problems uh, posted in the description of conic sections, but really it's just going to be an overview of what it's going to be about. So as you can see, there are four different kinds of conic sections um, in a particular cone. So you will have a circle, you'll then have an ellipse, a parabola, and a hyperbola. So the formulas are going to be on the side and on the right. And as I have mentioned in this uh, previous slide, I will post more problems in the description so that you would be able to practice them on your own. And the last thing that I would like to talk about are parametric uh, equations and polar and Cartesian systems. And this is probably the newest part of uh, calculus that a lot of students deal with. And it's the very last part of calculus too that um, everybody has to work with. So let's take a look. So on this slide, there are different kinds of parametric functions. Uh, these are just uh, samples of what um, you would basically see whenever you're working with parametric functions. But you will have x and y functions uh, when you're dealing with uh, coordinate systems like this. And you can see cosine of t and sine of t, they form a circle. And what happens is that you have an element that goes around in a particular uh, direction and it follows through based on the parametric functions of in relation to x and y. And so you can see with the different iterations of x and y, you can make squiggly lines like this, you can even make a star like this, but then you will also have a uh, direction um, based on the time aspect that you um, move accordingly. Uh, you're going to have multiple different changes that move along across this path. So and that's just a generalized idea on what parametric functions are and how they can be used in calculus too. And so now we move on into polar and Cartesian systems. And so uh, what we're dealing with here is we're usually dealt with a Cartesian system which is where we deal with points on x and y systems or coordinates like this. But then there's also polar, polar systems which deals with a radius and a particular degree angle. And so you can see your radius is going to be the length of this blue line and your angle is going to be uh, depending on the revolution. It could be uh, 720, it could be 540, it could be whatever degree measure you want but it can change depending on what kind of situation you're dealing with. And so on the next slide, I'll show you uh, the different kind of equations that uh, really show that. So on this slide, we have polar and Cartesian systems where you can uh, convert from polar to Cartesian, Cartesian to polar. And just like in Cartesian systems, we can find uh, the area underneath the curve that is presented in particular problems and this is the general formula that you can uh, deal with and then these are the formulas that you can find for your x y coordinates based on your radius and the uh, degree angle and vice versa for polar systems so let's try them out so now we're going to deal with a couple examples of polar systems so the first example that we have uh, we have a radius of two and so what this means is that you're going to have a radius of two all throughout doesn't matter what angle it is, you're going to have a radius of 2 basically in the shape of a circle. It's not the best circle in the world, but we'll deal with it. So you have 2, negative 2, and then 2, negative 2. This is just if you were to graph this in Cartesian on what it would look like, but it's 2 um, at 0 and then, at pi, and then you have it at uh, pi over 2 pi and then 3 pi over 2 just all 2 all throughout. And so now if we move on into this next example we have 4 sine of 2 theta. Now 
this is not necessarily going to be easy so the way I like to do this is I like to draw this on a graph so based on what I know from uh, graphing sines and cosines uh, what I could tell you is is that the amplitude is going to be at 4 so it's going to be 4 times as greater and your endpoint is going to be 2 pi and then you're going to have pi on over here and then 3 pi over 2 and then just pi by itself pi over 2 and so what happens is that you're going to have many different kinds of iterations so you're going to have a graph that goes up and then it goes down and then you have another graph that goes down and then up up and down and then down and then back up so it's not the best sign graph but you guys can understand it and then what I can do is I can break up these regions into eight regions and I'll show you guys why in a bit because how this all works is that you're following on how this radius all turns about so the highest point is something that we would have to figure out but it's nothing that can be impossible so the highest point at this particular section since it's a half this will be a quarter so it would be pi over four and then you have a half so then you have three quarters so three pi over four and then you have pi and then you have five pi over four and then you have 3 pi so that's 6 pi and you have 7 pi over 4 and then you have 8 pi which is just then 2 pi and so you have different sections and so when we're able to try and graph this uh, let's try and graph it on over here what happens is that you're going to have different sections and so as you can see uh, your radius is going to be positive and the section that we'll be uh, going up to is pi over 4 which is at a 45 degree angle and it's going to be at 4. So what happens is that your radius is going to increase and then it's going to go all the way to 4. And then this is in region 1. In region 2 you can see the radius is starting to big, uh, dip back down all the way back to the origin. So you're going to have more so this leaf effect going on right here and then you're going to have in section 3 you're going to have a dip that's going to go negative 4 but it's going to go at 3 pi over 4 and so with this you're gonna have 3 pi over 4 which you would think would be basically um, in this section, but since it's negative 4, it goes the opposite direction. And so, since it goes back down, it goes to this particular point. And then in section 4, it goes back. So that's 4. And then 5 pi over 4, which is basically in this section. On over here uh, you're going to go all the way to 4 so you're going to increase all the way down to 4 and then you're going to go all the way back and then you're going to finalize this entire leaf where at 7 pi over 4 you're going to go into the negative so essentially you would be in the fourth quadrant but since it's negative you would be going the other direction so you would ha have something like this and then you would close up the leaf like that so if we were to break this down even further you would have different sections and you can see on how those sections are related to the graph and it's a lot easier if you draw a sinusoidal graph and you would be able to graph this into a polar quadrant system like this. So that's pretty much it with polar systems. 
So I would like to thank everybody for watching this video. I hope this video has helped you out. Um, it is a good, simple review on what uh, Calculus 2 is going to be like. If you want more problems and in-depth explanations, you can check in the description down below. I'll attach reviews and answer keys as well so that you guys can find particular sections that you like and see on how I solve these particular problems. So I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please like and subscribe to my channel. And other than that, I'll see you guys in the next video.